You have blasphemy laws in your country, therefore your country is not free. OK, let's begin with my home country. England. Not the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Yes, there is a difference, especially as laws are different between each of the member countries within the UK. For one thing, Scotland and Wales have blasphemy laws on their books specifically intended to protect Christianity. Now the commenter who made this argument seems to think I live in a country that has blasphemy laws and therefore I do not live in a country that has freedom. Oy. Well, this is a nonsensical line of reasoning that just blows my fucking mind. I mean, really it does. England abolished the last of its blasphemy laws in 2008. Prior to this, blasphemy was an offence contrary to common law from the 17th century. Punishment for blasphemy included the death penalty up until 1676. In practice, within the last 20 years, charges of blasphemy generally didn't happen among the population and people were free to say what they wished with respect to their beliefs. Furthermore, having blasphemy as a criminal offence runs contrary to the European Convention on Human Rights, specifically the human right to freedom of religion. It has therefore been the case that blasphemy is a criminal offence has been, until its abolition, a difficult charge to have stick against the defendant. This is why the number of cases prosecuted, either successfully or unsuccessfully, can be counted without the aid of a calculator or a computer. And since 2008, blasphemy is not a criminal offence in England, where I live. To tell me therefore that I do not have freedom because I live in a country that has laws against blasphemy is factually inaccurate. But it gets better. Uh, the same commenter also told me that I do not have freedom in my country because of the existence of libel laws. Yes, he even appealed to the case of Simon Singh. Simon Singh was unsuccessfully sued for libel by the British Chiropractic Association in an English courtroom. The commenter in question called me a liar for pointing out that Simon Singh did not lose his case. This was because I said he was acquitted. This was because I misspoke, not because I was being intentionally dishonest. Unfortunately, the evangelists of the Randroid community never know how to tell the difference between a misspoken factual error and an outright and deliberate falsehood, even though they are committed several themselves. Whether Simon Singh had been acquitted or whether the British Chiropractic Association dropped their lawsuit against him is essentially irrelevant. The British Chiropractic Association did not win their libel suit against him because they had no facts to back up their position. Simon Singh did. The British Chiropractic Association sued Simon Singh in 2008 for libel in his criticism of their activities. The case went to court and prompted calls for the reform of libel laws in the UK. This is still ongoing. Simon was subsequently permitted to use the defence of fair comment in his case versus the British Chiropractic Association and eventually they dropped their case against him. Now, the commenter in question seems to be under the mistaken impression that the only reason Simon Singh did not lose his case and be successfully sued for libel was because the BCA dropped the case. Unfortunately, he is in no position to make this claim. It could well be the case that the BCA decided to drop their case against him on advice from their solicitors who were smart enough to see the potential loss that the BCA might have taken. The truth is, we don't know how well the case might have gone. To use Simon Singh as an example that truth is not a defence against libel is therefore factually inaccurate. And the use of Simon Singh's case as a singular example of a case in which libel laws allegedly prevent people from having freedom is also somewhat dishonest, because the commenter in question didn't cite any other cases in the legal system that were lost by those accusing their opponents of libel, did he? Of course he didn't, because it would have ruined his argument. The Daily Mail won a case brought against them for libel by Nathaniel Rothschild concerning a trip to Russia in January 2005. Now, I'm not a fan of the paper because it's essentially the equivalent of Fox News in the UK, but in this instance they won their case because they could prove that they were telling the truth. Truth is an absolute defence. The scientific journal Nature won its libel case against Mohammed El Nashi, former editor of Chaos, Solotons and Fractals, in July 2012. Yes, last month. The case involved criticism of CSF's research and scientific practices, which Nature, being a scientific peer-reviewed journal, understandably decided to critique. The case ran for three years, and at the end of it, the judge presiding over the case decided to dismiss the case outright. The link for the article referring to this case is in the usual place. So, once again, truth is an absolute defence. The case also continues to highlight the need for reforms in the UK's law covering libel and defamation, but the need for libel reforms in the UK does not make the UK a non-free country. It gets even better still. 
The same commenter then told me that my country is not free because pit bull terriers are a banned breed of dog and to paraphrase he said that any pit bulls in the country will be killed and that apparently is enough to scoff at the idea of freedom in the UK. <laughs> The commenter has once again shown what an idiot he is by making this kind of a connection to how free people are from whether a specific kind of dangerous dog is banned in the UK or not. Let's have a look at the laws concerning dangerous dogs, shall we? The law states that it is an offence to allow any dog to be dangerously out of control. According to the law, your dog is dangerously out of control if it injures a person or behaves in a way that makes a person worried it might injure them, even if the dog's owner is in his own home or garden. If you use your dog to injure someone, you could be charged with malicious wounding. The maximum penalty for this is five years in prison. A court could judge that your dog is dangerously out of control if it injures another person's animal or the owner of the animal thinks that they could be injured if they try to stop your dog attacking that animal. Under the Dangerous Dogs Act, pit bull terriers, as well as three other types, not breeds, of dogs, are considered dangerous and are therefore banned. The criteria for what is considered a dangerous dog is specified under sections 1 and 4b of the Dangerous Dogs Act 1991, linked below. Interestingly, a court can order that your dog be exempted from the Dangerous Dogs Act banned list under certain conditions. In order for this to happen, you need to follow certain criteria, such as neutering, tattooing, and microchipping your dog, keeping it muzzled and on a lead at all times while in public, and kept secure such that it cannot escape. The fact is that this situation in which a dangerous type of dog may need to be seized from a member of the public and put down is not one that is without its own due process in law. In order that you get your dog back, you can apply to the court system in the UK, present your case for why you think your dog is not a danger to members of the public. If you win your case, your dog will be returned to you. If you do not, your dog will not. And even if banned dogs were simply taken from you and destroyed without this due process, that doesn't restrict your general freedom to speech, movement or expression. It doesn't remotely compare to, for example, being arrested for promoting democracy in China, or being executed for treason if you, for instance, own a cell phone in North Korea, or set up a phone line on the border of North Korea to China such that you can contact the Chinese to request medical assistance if one of your workers in a mine shaft is injured and the nearest Korean hospital is farther away than the nearest Chinese one. Places like that are where the real suppression of freedom exists. Interestingly enough, the commenter who has made all of these talking points is also one of those that thinks that the legal system of the entire planet must follow that of the United States of America. Now, this came about as a result of my pointing out an example to someone else of what would happen to you if you were to commit an offence such as speeding or robbery. The commenter then asked me, apparently in all seriousness, if speeding was actually considered a crime where I lived. Frankly, this threw me off a little bit. But no, it turns out he was actually quite serious about this. I therefore told him, yes, speeding is considered a crime under the law in my country. He seemed incredulous at this, and I reiterated once again that speeding is considered a crime in the UK. What happened next? Go ahead, guess what he then asked me. Is it considered a felony or a misdemeanour? Wait a minute, what? Did he forget in our brief conversation that I do not live in the United States of America? The concept of a felony and a misdemeanour as criminal actions does not directly apply to UK law. Here you do not hear the expression felony or misdemeanour apply to any defined criminal act. The terminology used is criminal offence. So, here's a primer on what is considered a crime. Crime is the breach of rules or laws for which some governing authority, via mechanisms such as legal systems, can ultimately prescribe a conviction. Crimes may also result in cautions, rehabilitation, or be unenforced. Individual human societies may each define crime and crimes differently in different localities, state, local, international, at different time stages of the so-called crime, from planning, disclosure, supposedly intended, supposedly prepared, incomplete, complete, or future proclaimed after the crime. While every crime violates the law, not every violation of the law counts as a crime. For example, breaches of contract and of other civil law may rank as offences or as infractions. Modern societies generally regard crimes as offences against the public or the state, as distinguished from torts, wrongs against private parties that can give rise to civil causes of action. The definition of what constitutes a crime in this text is taken from the Wikipedia article linked below. Now, with respect to UK law, a violation of laws protecting the public interest is a criminal offence.
The article on English law linked below goes into some detail on this. Speeding and other driving offences, with the exception of parking violations, comes under the heading of criminal offence in UK law. The reason? Speeding is considered dangerous driving as it has the potential to put other road users at risk. Sections 2 and 2A of the Road Traffic Act 1988 goes into further detail regarding dangerous driving and is linked below. Driving too fast on the road that you are travelling on has the potential to put other people's lives at risk, once again. It is as simple as that. Now I know that the commenter that made this particular suggestion might try to argue that speeding fines and so on are an attempt to generate cash revenue. But I'm not interested in basement dwellers wearing their tinfoil hats. Speeding is considered a criminal offence because in the event of a collision or other traffic accident, the consequences of speeding are so much greater than the consequences of not speeding. Not to mention also that it is much more difficult to control your car when you are driving faster than you should be. Not all criminal offences result in a criminal record, but just because you do not get prison time or a criminal background check entry doesn't mean that you haven't been found guilty of a criminal offence. For example, if you are caught speeding and elect to take the fixed penalty speeding fine and endorsements on your license, then the matter is dealt with there and then. If, on the other hand, you dispute the claim and go to court, it is usually conducted in a criminal court. Subsequently, if you are found guilty of the offence of speeding in the court, your penalties will not only be greater, but you will also find that you have a criminal record as a result. So, yes, speeding is a crime in the UK. It has the potential to harm other people, Therefore, it is a crime. Now, just to answer some objections I can see coming from the other side of the universe, there are indeed some laws on the books that I consider to be either outdated or bigoted. Examples include keeping a disorderly house contrary to common law and the Disorderly Houses Act of 1751, Section 8. Solicitation for immoral purposes contrary to the Sexual Offences Act of 1956, Section 32 and various prostitution offences, of which I'm not going to list here because there are so many of them. Uh, if someone wishes to engage in prostitution, that should be their business. That's the way I look at it. And there are some other laws that are of questionable value to today's society. So, once again, as I stated in a previous video, I do not pretend the law is perfect, nor have I ever pretended that the law is perfect. The issue of why criminal law exists is the subject of another talking point that I will address in my next video.